Dr. Christine Lee is a dermatologist and director at East Bay Laser and Skin Care Center in Walnut Creek. She was fellowship trained in Mohs surgery, and her practice specializes in early detection and treatment of skin cancers. She recently spoke at the annual American Academy of Dermatology meeting and has been featured in many media outlets including the New York Times, USA Today, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Glamour, Fitness, Women's Day, CBS, NBC, Fox News, and the Discovery Channel, to name more than a few. <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much for coming to this event and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, this is Melanoma and Skin Cancer Awareness Month and uh, it's always this month because uh, it's important to kind of prepare people before the seven months of summer and it's a good reminder to all of us of all the things that we need to do to protect ourselves from um, the sun which is our friend but also our enemy. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to be talking about some of the, oh thank you so much, <clears throat> different kinds of skin cancer. Um, so just a brief overview of skin cancer, which I see a lot of in my practice, and we are in the middle of the biggest skin cancer epidemic in history. And uh, the reason is because we are all living longer. And so the longer you live, the more sun exposure you get throughout your life, the greater risk you have of developing skin cancer. And so it's become the most common form of cancer in the United States. Each year, there is more skin cancer than the combined incidence of breast, prostate, lung, and colon cancer. Over the past three decades, more people have skin cancer than all the other cancers combined. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer in the course of a lifetime. The three major types of skin cancer are melanoma, basal cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. Melanoma is the most deadly form of skin cancer. It's the number one killer in people under the age of 30. It's the most common form of cancer for young adults 25 to 29 years old. From 1970 to 2009, the incidence of melanoma increased over 800% amongst young women and 400% amongst young men. One person dies of melanoma every hour. A person's risk for melanoma doubles if he or she has had more than five sunburns at any age. One or more blistering sunburns in childhood or adolescence more than doubles a person's chance of developing melanoma later in life. Melanoma is the fifth most common cancer in men and the seventh most common cancer in women. Tanning beds, the sun, and cigarettes are all grouped together as the number one most dangerous cancer-causing substances. Tanning beds. You are literally paying someone to give you a skin cancer. If you use a tanning bed, you increase your chance of getting skin cancer by more than 1.5 times. The tanning booths double the risk for skin cancer. Just one indoor tanning session will increase your chance of developing melanoma by 20%. 15 to 30 minutes in a tanning booth is equal to an entire day at the beach. UV rays absorbed during a session is 20 times stronger than the rays of the sun. So what we teach our patients is if you're trying to self-monitor the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma. Uh, a is asymmetry. If you draw a line through this mole, the two halves will not match. So a symmetrical mole on the left, that's okay. On the right, that's an asymmetrical mole. You should have that looked at. Um, the, border, the borders of an early melanoma tend to be uneven. The edges may be scalloped or even notched. Color. Having a variety of colors is another warning sign. A number of different shades of brown, tan, or black could appear. A melanoma may also become red, blue, or some other color. The diameter. Melanomas usually are larger in diameter than the size of an eraser on your pencil, which is a quarter inch or six millimeters. So if you have a lot of large moles, you probably want to be uh, more vigilant about seeing a dermatologist. Uh, e, evolving. Any change in size, shape, color, elevation, or any other trait 
Um, even a symptom such as itching, bleeding, crusting, these all point to potential danger. So this is just a reminder of your A, B, C, D, E's, but they all start out small. They never start out looking that bad. So if you see something small and it's growing, that's something you should definitely have your dermatologist look at. So another thing that we look for are the ugly duckling. This method is based on the concept that these melanomas look different. They are the ugly duckling or the black sheep compared to surrounding moles. The patient's normal moles resemble each other like siblings, while the potential melanoma is an outlier. So these are three examples of an ugly duckling. So in A, you see that you know the moles are relatively small, and then there's one large one that stands out. In example B, you see that actually they're mostly dark, but then there's one white one that really stands out from the rest. And then C, you see there's just one solitary dark spot when the skin is just totally blank. So those are all things that you need to be aware of. So the average adult, young adult, who has about 10 to 20 um, moles, um, they can be at higher risk. So generally these normal moles have the following characteristics. They're round or they're oval. They're uh, border is normal and regular and well-defined, their color is uniform, their diameter is usually less than six millimeters, and they're often concentrated on sun-exposed areas of face, trunk, arm, and legs. And they usually occur during early childhood through ages um, you know, 35 to 40, they continue to get them. You'll start getting them young and you'll continue to get them throughout your life. And the uniformity of the moles, they resemble one another. So if you have a lot of these moles, um, that's not uh, definitely um, going to predict you are going to get a melanoma, but if you have a lot of larger moles, a lot of irregular moles, then you are at definitely higher risk. So these are called dysplastic nevi. Dysplastic nevi are large atypical moles. They are not normal, they are not melanomas, but people who have a lot of atypical moles are at much higher risk of getting a melanoma, and they have to learn how to monitor these and look for change, so it's very good to be looking yourself over once a month, having a dermatologist see you at least twice a year. Um, so if you have a family history of melanoma, it also puts you at higher risk, and you also need to be seen more frequently. So these are dysplastic nevi. These are not normal moles. So people who have a large number of these rather irregular, large-shaped moles, um, they are at higher risk of getting melanoma. And if you add on to that a family history of melanoma, then you really, really need to um, uh, be a lot more vigilant about sun protection, checking yourself over regularly, and seeing a dermatologist on a regular basis. Um, so most of these moles, they can kind of change, but they kind of change relatively to each other. So if you have one that seems to change suddenly, then that mole needs to be looked at. So um, if you have numerous moles, whether they're atypical or normal, some of the things that you need to look for are itching, pain, elevation, bleeding, crusting, swelling, oozing, ulceration, and if they are trying, uh, really a dark black um, or blue color. Um, melanomas that occur within a dysplastic nevus. So you can have um, a, an irregular mole, you've had it your whole life, and you can have it for 10 or 20 years and it could be fine. It could literally overnight change into melanoma or it could change very slowly over a period of time. Or you could get a melanoma that just arises out of just normal skin. It doesn't necessarily have to arise within a mole. Um, so many different kinds of moles, you, can't tell, you're thinking, wow, this always looks this way, I can't tell, it's black and, you know, it's very dark and it's large, um, and if it suddenly grows or it gets a different color, then that's an emergency. But if you're just looking at your mole and you're thinking, I just don't know what this is, um, you know, you really should have it looked at. The only sure way is to get a biopsy. So this looks like it would be bad because it's big, it's really dark, but that's not a melanoma. This is what we call a seborrheic keratosis, and people are covered with these. And that's the hardest part. As you get older, you literally get covered with these things that are basically like barnacles. They're seborrheic keratosis or excess skin. And, you know, Barnacle Bill the sailor, I mean, he, he was covered with these. You know, he got that name for a reason. And so usually they just occur in sun-exposed areas, and as you get older, um, you, you do get more of these. And um, people oftentimes like to get them removed for cosmetic reasons, but they are a slight 
risk for cancer. Um, and the difficulty is that if you're covered with these, it makes it hard for us to tell like, well, when are you really getting a cancer? And so it does make for a diagnostic challenge. Um, so if you have, you know, and I'm sure you've all seen people with these, and many of these people have people come running up to them and say, oh my gosh, you look like you have a melanoma on your back. You should get it looked at, and they're like, oh, I have people tell me that all the time. But, um, you know, you might just have a few. You might have literally thousands of them covering your body, but these are not melanoma. Every one of these pictures is a normal seborrheic keratosis. Um, they don't look attractive, but um, the, the problem is occasionally we will get one of these developed a melanoma within it and so that's the hard part is once you've had one it's hard to calm someone down and not make them think that they need to go and get every one of them removed off their body and if they honestly asked me well can you guarantee me I'm not going to get another melanoma in one of these it's like no I'm sorry but nobody can make that guarantee but even if we went and removed every one of them off your body that still does not guarantee that you're not going to get a melanoma and it's not really practical to go and remove you know thousands of them but um, the best way to proceed with these is to monitor them carefully and have yourself and your spouse or partner look yourself over regularly and if anything looks suspicious at all then go into your dermatologist and we'll help you remove it. Um, so while melanoma is very uncommon in African Americans, Latinos, and Asians, it is frequently more fatal when it's found in these populations. And so melanomas in ethnic populations occur more often in non-exposed skin opposite of Caucasian, where it occurs more often in its sun-exposed areas. Ethnic skin patients usually get it in unexposed skin, like the palms, the soles, the mucous membranes, and the nails, and even the eyes. And they're usually with much worse outcome than Caucasians. Um, the reggae musician Bob Marley died at age 36 of me metastatic melanoma from his toe. And he, it is unfortunately um, rather um, the common fate that we see when uh, melanoma occurs in that population. So with people with more than 50 moles, atypical moles are family history of melanoma. Um, though they're all at increased risk for melanoma. Those are all increased risk factors, and every one of those uh, risk factors increases your risk of developing melanoma exponentially. Uh, you can get any form of skin cancer at any age, but the risk increases greatly the longer a person lives. Melanoma is the most common in white men over 50, but everyone else is also at risk. It's just that we see it most in that population, but we see it in young people, we see it in every race, men and women, so no one is totally safe. Uh, there's no such thing as a healthy tan. Both a sunburn and a suntan indicate that UV rays have caused free radicals to form within the skin, and DNA damage has occurred. So 80% of the sun damage that eventually leads to skin cancer forming happens before the age of 18. But as I mentioned before, the reason skin cancer is on the rise, and it is the only cancer that is on the rise, um, other cancers have been on the decline while skin cancer is on the rise because it is an accumulative effect over your lifetime. So even though you get most of the damage before you turn 18, um, the longer you live, the more sun damage you get, um, the greater your increased uh, chance of getting skin cancer. So going on to the most common kind of cancer, um, it's not the most deadly, but it's the most common, is basal cell carcinoma. Uh, it's usually seen in middle age and elderly, and it's usually due to solar radiation, and it's most commonly on the face, ears, neck, trunk, and extremities, on the face, especially the nose, cheeks, forehead, and around the eyes, because that's where you get the most sun exposure. And it, if you get one of these, you frequently will get another one within another five years. So here are some examples of some basal cell carcinomas, and these are um, very typical, but they can sometimes look like a pimple, they might look like a crust or a scab, sometimes they're even pigmented, and sometimes they can be a large scaly patch. So they don't always look the same. So anytime you have a lesion that's not healing, you should get it looked at, because a pimple or a bug bite will go away after a month, but a skin cancer will not. It will persist and continue to grow. So uh, basal cell carcinomas in general um, grow slowly. Um, they can present with bleeding and ulceration, and they can usually enlarge over months to years. But sometimes they can um, be very invasive, and even a basal cell can be very destructive going into the muscle, cartilage, and bone. The next slide is very graphic, and I um, want to warn you, if you 
um, don't want to see something that could be very disturbing, please just close your eyes and I will go through this very quickly. But the reason I'm showing this picture um, is just to show you that even basal cells can sometimes be really bad. Um, so, you know, um, there's some people who think like, oh, basal cells, no big deal, I'll just ignore it. But there are some cases where it can be quite destructive. Okay, so here I go. <laughs> I'm gonna go through it very quickly. They can be very destructive and those are not common, so I don't want you to have nightmares about that. And those of you who <laughs> are taking good care of yourself, you're never gonna let something like that happen, but we unfortunately do see cancers that can be that severe. Um, so basal cell carcinoma, usually what you see on the tip of the skin is just the tip of the iceberg. The problem with skin cancers is what you see is not always what you get. Um, the root on the bottom, and you cannot see it, it's not visible, could be spreading very quickly and it could get very large before you even see it on the surface. Squamous cell carcinoma is also a deadly form of cancer. It's uh, the second most common skin cancer and it can be fatal, just like melanoma. And it usually rises primarily on sun damaged skin and it can occur from actinic keratoses. Um, also occurs like on the face, the mouth, the lips, the nose, the back of the hands, the chest and the back. But it can also occur in non-sun exposed areas like the anal genital region and your extremities and toes and fingers and your palms and the bottoms of your feet. So it has many different appearances. Sometimes it can just erupt like a volcano and literally overnight someone can have a huge tumor that doubles in size within a week or they can have a flat kind of scaly crusty lesion. It can occur anywhere on the body, including the lips, but usually um, it's anything that's fast growing, that's alarming, you should have it looked at right away. Um, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common cancer amongst African Americans and Asian Indians. Um, SCCs in African Americans and Asians tend to be more aggressive and are associated with 20 to 40% risk of metastasis or spreading. About 90% of the skin cancers are associated with UV exposure from the sun, and about half of all Americans who live to age 65 will have either a basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma at least once. So now going on to the treatment. Um, there are various treatments. Um, one of the very standard, simple ways is called electrodesiccation and curatage. It's a basic scrape and burn. Um, this does not have a high cure rate. It lacks margin control. You don't really have any tissue to prove that it's gone. Um, and it's basically a blind procedure. Uh, cryotherapy, um, it's a more old fashioned method using liquid nitrogen to freeze the skin cancer. We use liquid nitrogen more nowadays to freeze precancers. Skin cancer is really, um, you know, this is not a standard treatment for that, although there might be some people who still offer this. Um, the problem with this, it also lacks margin control. It's a blind destruction. You don't know if you've gotten all the cancer, but it has been used. So radiation therapy. It can be very effective in certain areas that we're gonna be having uh, Dr. Kamath and Dr. Raman talk in um, detail about it, and it's a great adjunct to skin cancer surgery, especially Mohs. And I oftentimes refer for radiation, but there are some patients because of their age or because they have too many comorbidities or they're just not a good surgical candidate that sometimes this is our only option. And um, so it can be used either as the primary or adjuvant uh, role used with surgery in conjunction with surgery. Usually requires multiple treatments over a few weeks to several weeks. And the tumor may recur in a more aggressive form. And um, in certain patients, this is probably the best treatment, um, but it is a, 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 a very commonly used adjunct to surgery. Uh, lasers, um, a lot of you have been reading about how lasers are being used to treat skin cancers, but it's not the gold standard, and the problem is we don't have any tissue proof that the cancer has been removed. But there are some situations in which somebody may have an extremely large cancer, we cannot treat it with surgery, we may attempt to treat it with a CO2 or ergam YAG. Also, photodynamic therapy is use of a chemical uh, called 5, it's levulin, 5-amino levulinic acid. And when you paint this chemical on and then you activate it with a blue light, it can help to destroy precancerous and some cancerous cell. But once again, this is not a gold standard treatment and the cure rate um, is not the highest. Surgical excision. So um, traditional excision with safety margins of up to three to five millimeter margins. Um, uh, you can remove it surgically, but this usually leaves a much larger scar and it may not get the whole skin cancer out with your first attempt. 
Uh, also because of the way that the tissue is looked at, um, vertical sections where the skin is cut in vertical, like bread loaf, um, and I'll compare it to Mo's, um, there are some blind spots in the tissue. So it does not have the highest accuracy in terms of even proving that the cancer is gone. So that's why the cure rate is about 90%. So most micrographic surgery, and that's what I specialize in, um, only certain doctors do this, and you have to have fellowship training to, um, uh, it's an advanced training beyond uh, your dermatology residency to specialize in those, and it has the highest cure rate, 97 to 99%, and it's considered the gold standard for treating skin cancers. The reason it is the gold standard is the only method by which you can guarantee that you actually have removed the whole skin cancer because you're able to look at the tissue at the time of surgery. We actually are able to visualize all sections of the skin. We have what's called a horizontal section instead of the bread loafing. You can actually see the entire section of skin, the panoramic view, so there are no blind spots. And so if you actually don't see any cancer left when you do a Mohs frozen section, then you can be sure that there's no cancer left. Um, so it is also because uh, it's a t um, tissue sparing technique, uh, we don't have to remove any more tissue than is necessary. It also then ensures the best cosmetic outcome because in critical areas such as the eye, nose, and mouth, you don't really want to remove a large section of skin unless you absolutely have to. So we take small little sections and we look at each section in the microscope and then we keep taking little sections until we know we got the whole cancer out. So um, it's used on certain types of tumors. We do not do Mohs. Uh, it's not gold standard for melanoma. And the reason is because melanoma can have what are called skip lesions. So you don't want to have small, small margins when you're dealing with melanoma. So with melanoma, the gold standard is to take wide excision. So anybody who has a melanoma, normally, even if it's a very small lesion, it's going to end up with a huge scar because you really have to take half a centimeter to centimeter margins to ensure that you've got any skip lesions. Um, so there are some doctors who do Mohs for melanoma, it's controversial. And there are some situations with after careful counseling, someone might opt to do Mohs you know, for melanoma. Um, so when you are looking for a Mohs surgeon, there are a lot of doctors who claim to do Mohs, who learn from doing, uh, literally learn from a weekend course. And so to be a legitimate Mohs surgeon, you have to finish the dermatology residency, and there's only a few programs in the country that actually are accredited to train doctors to do this procedure. And every one of those surgeons who's qualified is part of the American College of Mohs Surgery. If your doctor who says they're a Mohs surgeon is not listed with the American College of Mohs Surgery, they are not a legitimate Mohs surgeon. So it is the gold standard for non-melanoma skin cancer. And um, see on the left how small that lesion looks and how large it ended up being after looking at it um, under the microscope. So we want to get the whole cancer out, but we don't want to remove any more tissue than is necessary. So tissue conservation is key. And obviously, it's certain parts like I have a, a story about a surgeon. He almost lost his thumb who an interesting a doctor would not know about Mohs, and um, he was about to have a plastic surgeon um, have to remove, he had a squamous cell carcinoma on his nail, and he was going to have to uh, lose his whole finger. But at a lunch meeting, and this was at the medical center, he happened to listen to a Mohs talk, and then he thought, oh my gosh, I should go see this Mohs surgeon. And then that Mohs surgeon at that center, um, this is why I was a resident, he was my mentor. He actually saved this gastroenterologist's thumb. He was able to remove the cancer without amputating his finger, and that's why he was able to continue to work. So um, there's many situations like that where you just don't want to go and cut out a large piece of tissue just to clear the cancer because you still have to worry about whether or not the patient is able you know, to function afterwards. So uh, what we do with Mohs is we identify the tumor, we debulk it, we take one to two millimeter margins around it, and then we mark it. We do what's called a frozen section. We freeze the tissue. I have a technician who actually prepares the tissue for me. Then I look at it under the microscope because as a Mohs surgeon, I'm also trained in pathology. 
and then we continue to take small sections until we've cleared the whole cancer. Here's what it looks like while we're doing it. Um, this is how we identify and mark the tumor. Then we actually take a one to two millimeter border around it. And then we actually do little hatch marks and um, that's made on the skin to help us orient the tissue. And then the tissue is removed. And then we actually stain and color code the tissue so that we know exactly how it's oriented on the skin. And the sections here, you see they're color coded for orientation. And then um, it is actually fixed and embedded onto the cryostat. And then my technician helps me, he mounts the tissue and he slices it into very tiny little slices, puts them on a glass slide, and then I look at them under the microscope. And then after it's red, and then you can see that's the, how the tissue looks under the microscope, we can actually see are there any more tumor cells, and it helps us uh, be able to identify where we need to go and back and take an additional section. We look at it again, and we keep doing this until we see absolutely no more tumor at the margins. So it's an extremely high cure rate um, with uh, various methods for doing the closure. And this is where you might actually find that um, uh, different closures are done, flaps, grafts, different types of repairs. Um, depending on how extensive the lesion is, either I would do the repair, I have reconstructive surgery training, but if it's really advanced and, um, for example, it goes to the cartilage, I might have to work with the ear, nose, and throat or plastic surgeon. Um, uh, I've had patients who've had to get a prosthetic afterwards. Um, we work with oculoplastic surgeons and it's going into the eyeball. And so there are many different specialists that we work as a team approach. And then of course, if it's that extensive, we would always then also work with a radiation oncologist. Um, so here's a cancer on the nose and you can see with second intent healing without doing anything, it heals fabulous. Um, here's an example of someone who had a skin cancer in front of the ear with a complex linear closure and you can see the end result is um, barely visible. And so I'm showing you these so that you know that uh, regardless of where it is on your face or what kind of cancer you have and what the size, um, with the flap repair, um, you can look forward to a very good outcome and many of these patients don't even look like they had anything done afterwards. Uh, so this gentleman, he had a more extensive one. I had to do a bilo flap, and then you can see that's the after. Um, this is a skin graft, and that's after the skin graft has had time to heal. And oftentimes, I will do some laser resurfacing over the graft to make sure that the skin looks completely smooth. So we do have to sometimes do things with lasers to help the scar. And this is a flap on the nose, and you can see afterwards it's barely visible. This person also had an advancement rhombic flap um, that I had to use to cover that defect. And this is a very large uh, cancer in the arm where we had to do skin graft. Um, this is one near the eye, and you can see afterwards there's been no disruption of her anatomy, and she looks, um, she can barely see it. This person had a huge skin cancer, which I repaired with a flap. Um, this person had also a, um, a one near the corner of the eye, and a skin graft where you can barely see the graft afterwards. And this person had a transposition flap, and you can see it's a very large lesion on a very young lady, and she's a very beautiful young lady. And obviously, um, on every person, it's important that afterwards that you know that you're not going to look deformed. And so, skin cancer doesn't have to be frightening um, if you get the proper things done. And as you prepare for the summer, I just want to remind you. So do you want to be Snooky from Jersey Shores or Snow White? That's your choice. Thank you very much.